We're doing a seminar here this weekend about how to release God's power in our lives. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. And we do believe that your word changes us. It's energetic and operative and it renews our minds and breaks bondages off of us. And I pray that tonight as people hear that they have power and authority, that they will believe it and begin to walk in it in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus didn't die so we could all be pitiful and pathetic and weak and wimpy and moan and groan and complain and murmur all the time and be afraid of everything. He died so that we could have a powerful, bold, amazing, fruitful life. And not just so we could have a good life, but so we can reach out to other people in love, helping them to find their way to Christ also. The devil is alive and well on planet Earth, but the good news is, is although he has power, we have power and authority. And the only authority he has is what we give him, and most of the time we give it to him through lack of knowledge, or sometimes through laziness, not just being willing to do what we know we need to do when we need to do it. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, a very important verse for this seminar. Because it says, behold, I have given you power. So it's kind of like God saying, wake up, look around, and realize that I have already given you power. Already given you power. You don't have to wait for God to give you power. You need to believe that you have it. In Ephesians 1.19, the apostle Paul prayed for the church, and he said, I pray that they would know the power that's available, the surpassing greatness of his power that is available to those who believe. Now, as a believer in Christ, this power is available to you, but if you don't believe in that power, then you won't experience it in your life. I was a believer in Christ for many years, but I didn't believe that I was right before God through the blood of Christ. I didn't know that. So therefore, although I was saved, I also spent every day condemned and guilty and full of shame from my past. It's not only important that we believe in Christ, but it's important that we believe everything that he said and every promise that he's given us. And I don't know what kind of life you live, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus died so you could have power. And you do not have to be under something all the time. You can be on top and have the victory. The Bible says so many amazing things, like we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. I said last night that I believe to be more than a conqueror means that you don't even worry about the next problem that's coming up because you already know before you get the problem that you're going to have the victory. That keeps us from having to be afraid of problems. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The greater one lives in us. You have power. Satan has power but you have power and authority. Behold, I have given you power, authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions. That's talking about demonic spirits and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. Now that doesn't mean that nothing will come against you, but it does mean that even if you go through the fire, you'll come out and not be burned. If you go through the flood, you won't drown. If you go through problems, you won't be overwhelmed. We have a going through anointing on our life. And that's much better than being stuck somewhere. So the good news for you tonight, and please take this, no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter how impossible your situation might seem, you are going through. You're not stuck in the middle. If you have taken a hold of the hand of Christ, you are going through and you will come out on the other side and you won't even smell like smoke. Amen. Amen. Now Acts chapter one, verse eight says, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. I love that. To be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This power that we're talking about is a power to do miracles, its ability, its strength, its might, but it's also power that produces moral excellence of soul. And so what that means is that God gives us the power to be godly in an ungodly world. 
God gives us the power to do what's right when we feel all wrong. God gives us the power to forgive people who deeply hurt us and to pray for them and to even bless them. That takes power. You have power to smile when you're having a bad day. You have power to be a blessing. We have power to have moral excellence of soul. In other words, we have the power to be like Jesus. We just have to call on that power. The first thing that you need to qualify for the power of God to be released in your life is to know that in and of yourself you're weak. If we think that we can do it, then we won't fully lean on God. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. The Amplified Bible says timidity, cowardice, craven and cringing and fawning fear. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and a well-balanced mind and a spirit of discipline and self-control. I love that. So just so we have it right, let's look at how this is supposed to go. We have a spirit of power over the enemy. We're to use our power to not let the devil rule our lives and to behave like Jesus wants us to behave. We're to love people and to control ourselves. But so often we love ourselves and want to control people. Come on now, we get it all mixed up and we want to use our power to control God. We use our power against the enemy, we love people and we control ourselves. And when we do that, everything starts to work together really sweet and nice. You don't have to live in fear. You do not have to live in fear. You may feel fear, but you don't have to bow down to it. There's a difference in feeling it and giving into it. We're all going to feel fear at different times in our lives, but the only way to conquer fear is to do it afraid. The only way you can conquer fear is to go ahead and do what you know that God wants you to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to be aggressive against the enemy. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, it teaches us that we are to resist the devil at his onset. Be vigilant. Be diligent. Keep doing what we know we need to do and not let the enemy have the upper hand. We cannot be lazy Christians. We cannot be people who give up easy. We have to stay stirred up in the fire of God. And that's why it's so wonderful to take time to come to things like this and to be in your church on a regular basis and to listen to the word and to spend time with God. Because I'll tell you, one day in the world can suck a lot of stuff out of you. And I'm just going to tell you, you're not going to survive on a little 15-minute sermonette on Sunday morning somewhere. you got to have mega doses of the word of God if you're going to last today. And so I stopped in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus had been dealing with different demonic spirits and then he said that a strong man cannot come into your house and rob you unless he first would bind the man in the house. And that's talking about really how the devil cannot come in and rob our lives if we will bind him and not let him have authority over us. And it's something that you just do by making a decision. I'm not going to let the devil rule my life. I know the word of God. I'm going to live by the word of God. I'm not going to believe the lies of Satan. I'm, I'm going to believe the word. And so you just come against him. You just, I come against you in Jesus name. It's very simple. I know who I am in Christ. I resist you in the name of Jesus. You know, we need to be decisive, and I've just formed a habit. When I first start getting full, I quit eating. I don't wait till I'm stuffed, because when you first feel full, 20 minutes later, you're going to feel a lot more full. So if you stuff yourself, then 20 minutes later, you're going to be miserable, and then you just feel like this, well, you just feel terrible, just terrible. And so I've formed a habit, and even people who eat with me can tell you, when I start getting full, before I feel completely full, I stop eating. The second thing I do is my push my plate away from me 
and I make a declaration, I'm done. <laughs> and I believe that if you want to be successful against the enemy, you need to use a similar formula. You make a decision that you are going to be watchful over your lives. The Bible says watch and pray. And we're not supposed to watch everybody else. We're supposed to watch what's going on in our own lives. I mean, you know, I've had people come to me and say, I'm just so upset the devil's been lying to me. Now, what sense does that make? I mean, if, if you know it's the devil and you know he's a liar, then why be upset about it? <laughs> but this room is probably full of people who you had many upsetting moments last week because you listened to the lies of Satan and you were not aggressive against him. You didn't say, shut up. No, it is written. You just stood there. You know what a passive person is? It's somebody who wants something good to happen, and they're going to stand there and wait to see if it does. There's two kinds of people in the world. People who wait for things to happen and people who make things happen. Which kind of person are you going to be? Amen? Take your ground. So we are told that we can bind the strong man. Every morning in my prayers, I say out loud, I bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. He has no authority over my life. He is not going to rob me today of anything that is mine. He is not going to rob my family. And we even include our partners in that prayer. And you are not going to rob my partners. Now, I get it started for you, but I can't keep the enemy off you if you're going to let him in. We have authority, but how much authority can we really exercise in somebody else's life? Can I tell you something? You cannot help anybody that won't do their part. You cannot help people that won't do their part. I have the most authority over my life. Next to that, I have some authority in my family and maybe people that I'm close to. But you just cannot help people that will not help themselves. So probably instead of praying for God to help everybody, we need to pray for people to get activated and let God help them. James chapter 4, verse 7. Love this. We usually only quote half of this. I heard it for years. Resist the devil and he will flee, but that's not what the Scripture says. It says, submit yourself to God. <laughs> Be subject to God resist the devil and he will flee from you. I might as well just say there's no point in trying to resist the devil if you're not going to make a decision that you're going to submit to God. Wonder how many people go to study the Bible and they've already made their mind up that they're going to obey what they learn. This is not a selective thing. Do you know that it's actually dangerous to read the Bible? <laughs> you say, what do you mean? Well, because if you're ignorant, you might get a little past, but once you know what's right and don't do it, and don't say, well, I'm just not going to read it then. No, because now you'll be held accountable for that too. But I wonder how many even had this thought. I'm going to go over to that conference tonight, Lord, and I'm so excited to learn something, and I already make my mind up before I ever even hear it that whatever you teach me, God, I'm going to do it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> no, you know, we kind of hear it, and if we don't like it, we just let that one go... <laughs> Or we make excuses, well, that's too hard, or you don't understand, or, or then sometimes we play dumb, well, I don't really quite understand that. <laughs> so I really want to encourage you from now on when you study the Bible, and, you know, I was talking to another minister today who is well-versed in Scripture, and I said, is there any place in the Bible where it says read the Bible? We couldn't think of one. It says study. 
There's a difference in reading and studying. And we read for quantity to get our little check mark in our heavenly calendar so God's happy with us for the day. And what we need to do is go to this thing like it's our life. When you know this and you believe it, you become dangerous to the enemy. When you put your feet on the floor in the morning, demons scream. She's up again. <laughs> you have power and authority. You can bind the enemy. You can submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Do you know that you can rebuke and resist a bad mood? Well, I can't help how I feel. You can if you want to. And the best way to resist it is at the onset. The minute you start to get some kind of goofy thought about how pitiful you are, come on. The minute the devil invites you to a pity party, say no. I've been to those, they're not enjoyable, they're counterproductive, get thee behind me, Satan. These are the kind of the things we gotta watch for. We watch and we, and we pray. Wait a minute, I, you know, I said yesterday I had a fault finding day. I mean, I was just, everybody's flaw, I was seeing it, it was like Whoa. Well, you know, that's not normal for me. And that's not what God wants. And so you have to realize that is an attack of the enemy trying to distract you and get you to lose your focus. Are you with me? Has anybody noticed how hard it is today to stay focused on anything for even a few minutes? Spirits of distraction. The enemy doesn't want us to get anything from God. Matthew chapter 16. You're going to have to be more aggressive if you want to be victorious. And I'm talking about being aggressive in the spirit. Don't get aggressive with people. Get aggressive in the spirit. The Bible says in Matthew 11:12. The kingdom of God has suffered violence from the days of John the Baptist until the present time, but the violent take it by force. It's talking about, if, if you look at the Greek, it says, the kingdom of God has suffered abuse and attack, but the energetic take it by force. Instead of just letting the enemy be violent with you, get violent back. But don't get violent in the flesh, get violent in the spirit. Jesus was explaining to his disciples that it wasn't going to be long and he was going to be leaving them and going to pay the price and go through the suffering that he'd been trying to tell them about. And in verse 22 it says, then Peter took him aside to speak to him privately <laughs> and began to reprove and charge him sharply, saying, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, get behind me, Satan. Now, the devil will work through people to try to derail you and distract you and get you away from what God wants you today to do on any given day. I mean, I don't know. Let's just take something practical. You're a mom. Uh, you've gotten somebody that's going to watch your kids that day. You've got a plan. You are today, you are getting your house in order. I mean, you are getting the laundry done. You're getting the dishes done. You're cleaning out that closet that's driving you batty. You're going to balance the checkbook that hasn't been balanced in two years. You're like, this is it. Now, the enemy doesn't want you to have any order because he wants the disorder to drive you crazy. And he wants you to get to the end of another day and feel like a total failure because you had a good plan and didn't work your plan. And so a friend calls. What are you doing? Oh, I'm getting ready to do this and so and this and so. 
Well, what are you doing with the kids? Oh, I got, somebody's watching them for me today. Oh, you don't have any kids? Listen, there's a big sale out at the mall. Let me pick you up and we'll go and I'll take you to lunch. Now your friend may be as sweet as she can be. She's innocent, but the enemy is still using her. She's not a wicked person, but the enemy is still using her, especially if you say no and she keeps trying to talk you into it. We need to stop trying to talk people into doing what we want them to do and pray for them to be led by the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I said? We need to stop trying to talk people into doing what we want them to do and encourage them to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, it might be better if the friend would say, well, you know what, I, I know that your disorder's been really bugging you. I think I'm gonna come over today and help you. That would be better. When somebody hurts you, it's the enemy trying to bring you down. When somebody, you hear that somebody's been talking about you, it's the enemy trying to bring you down. When you have a dream and a vision for your life and people tell you how that could never happen to you, that's the enemy trying to bring you down. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Stop getting mad at people for what the devil is trying to do to you and start, stop coming against the people and start coming against the enemy. Think about Jesus. Here he's here for an assignment from God. He's getting very close to the time to fulfill the will of God. It's going to be hard enough already. He needed some encouragement, some, not some discouragement. And Peter, one of his closest friends and associates, says, Oh, no, Lord, this, this is wrong. This is all wrong. This can't happen. This is not right. And Jesus immediately recognized what was going on. Get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense. You're in my way. You're, in a, you're a hindrance. He knew that the enemy was using him to try to keep him from doing the will of God. Now, I don't necessarily suggest that you look at your friends and say, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> that might not be the best plan. But I do suggest that you know in your heart what's going on and maybe under your breath, you turn around and say, uh-uh, devil. You're not doing it to me. How many of you, when you just think a little bit about the week you've just had, you now realize that the enemy used a person? How about a person to upset you? A person to get you to lose your peace? A person to cause you to lose your focus? a person to discourage you. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Learn how to stop blaming people and start dealing with the source of the problem spiritually. In the spirit, you deal with those problems. Amen? The devil works through people to try to get us out of the will of God. There's no point in getting mad at them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, we, we probably get used in the same way sometimes. People can make us angry, hurt us, betray us, tell lies about us. But now here, here's a big thing I'm gonna tell you. Instead of getting mad at the people, now this is a big secret in the Word of God, so listen up. Somebody hurts your feelings. You hear somebody's gossiping about you and it just crushes you, you're really hurt because it was somebody you trusted and loved. Your first temptation is to get mad at the people but then you realize it's just the enemy trying to upset you and you know how important it is to keep your peace. So you say a little prayer, who knows, maybe you just go to the bathroom, you're out in public or something, you say, Lord, I thank you that you're on my side and no weapon formed against me shall prosper and I rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. I know that this is not really the person, it's the enemy trying to hold me back. Then, then, instead of getting mad at the person, 
You do what the Bible says in Romans 12, 21, and you overcome evil with good. So somebody tried to hurt you, your response is, I'm not only not going to get mad at you, I'm going to resist the devil, and I'm going to go a step further and go do something nice for somebody. Well, God has so graciously provided everything that we need to live in victory. But we just need to learn how to use all the spiritual weapons and the armor that He has made available to us as believers in Jesus Christ. It's 6 a.m. and another sweltering day in Prasat, Cambodia. A number of people have already gathered outside the entrance to the Hand of Hope Health Center, some arriving as early as 5 a.m. For Dr. Yim and his team of doctors and medical staff, it's a typical weekday for treating some of Cambodia's most impoverished for a multitude of health issues that range from injuries, malnutrition, to diseases, it was for this very purpose that the Hand of Hope Hospital and on-site pharmacy opened March of 2009. For Kim Savuth, the Hand of Hope Center was his only hope. After a trek into the mountains to find wood to sell in support of his family, he returned home with symptoms of chills and fever. <laughs> alarming news for Kim. For him and others in the Prasad area, it's nearly impossible to get medical treatment without the free services of Hand of Hope Health Center. Adverse living conditions are commonplace in the area surrounding Prasad. The Savuth family's level of poverty is so startlingly bleak that they can barely afford the basic necessities to survive. The day we visited Kim, their meal was a rat that Kim's mother cooked on an open fire. Joyce Meyer die is toch van tv? Wat doet ze nog meer? Ze schrijft boeken. Er zijn ook dvd's, themaboekjes, mokken. Hé, hey, dat kan ik allemaal niet onthouden. Daarom is er de Joyce Meyer info- en productbrochure. Die kan je kosteloos bestellen. Online of telefonisch. Super!